Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is human-computer interaction. Human-computer interaction, or HCI, is an important field of study in computer science. It focuses on how to improve interactions between humans and computers. And the computers that you are working on today are a good sign of the success of HCI because HCI is responsible for things like the Windows icon, mouse, and pointer or WIMP interface that we're all using. And the fact that you are all using graphical user interfaces instead of command line interfaces where we're typing out the computer uh, shows that HCI researchers have had a huge impact on our world. Hot topics currently in HCI include virtual and augmented reality, speech commands, gestures where you're using your hands to uh, interact with the computer, and HCI researchers are even studying brain-computer interfaces. One thing I always like to point out when I'm teaching my classes, because I teach a lot of non-computer science students, is that there's a lot of different fields out there that are actually very important for HCI work. And some of you may be studying these fields right now. And so one of those is psychology. Psychology is directly related to HCI in a number of different ways. For one thing, having a better understanding of human cognition can lead to better applications. So things like how do humans perceive colors or what are the limitations of human memory should be driving our applications. In addition, psychological research has a lot of similarities with computer science user interface research. And so in the basement of the psychology building, there's a bunch of rooms where we bring in intro to psych students and uh, ask them to perform tasks. And on the other side of a one-way glass mirror, uh, we've got psych grad students who are watching how they carry out those tasks. ACI researchers do the exact same thing in large computer science companies. So we have the same rooms with the one-way glass. We've got a computer set up there. Um, we bring in some test subjects and we ask them to carry out tasks on our computer and we see how they're actually interacting with the computer, whether they're able to use the computer the ways we expect. Um, and typically, again, for the larger companies, we will actually have psychologists uh, on staff who uh, understand how to run these experiments properly. Uh, another imp important related field is graphic design. And, uh, and you know, when I was working in industry, we had a bunch of people from, uh, from art schools who were working on staff, uh, specifically to work on HCI work. Um, obviously, ergonomics is super important. And then sociology and ethnography uh, and other related fields are also really important for HCI. Uh, I think particularly now uh, that so many of the applications are designed for multiple people to use and how to help groups interact, uh, the importance of sociologists is, of course, really obvious there. But uh, another way in which sociologists and ethnographers are really important is if we're asked to go in and help improve a particular uh, workplace, we need sociologists and ethnographers to go in and study that workplace and have a good understanding of what's going on in that workplace before we can uh, help automate and computerize that workplace. Let's take a quick look at some of the things that uh, user interface experts do when they're trying to design a new UI. The first thing you should do is some need finding. We want to determine what the user's actual needs are. And so we're going to spend some time observing the workplace, uh, studying the current processes, and interviewing potential users. We're then going to determine what the different roles within that workplace are and what the different tasks that are regularly carried out in that workspace. And then we're going to do some prototyping. We're going to do some testing of those prototypes, and then we're going to iterate. This last part is really important because it turns out that we aren't particularly good at coming up with uh, programs that actually help in the workplace. And so it's really important that not only do we interview people and uh, come up with ideas based on what the feedback that they're giving us in the interviews are, but that we test them out and try them again. It's actually not uncommon for users to think that they want a program. And then when they actually try out the program to realize, oh, this isn't as helpful as I thought. I think maybe what we really want is this other thing. And so that process of iteration where you work 
in conjunction with your potential users to try out different things and ultimately really identify what they actually need as opposed to what their initial perceived uh, concerns are is super important. The prototypes you can build range in quality from low fidelity to high fidelity, or as they're sometimes referred to as low fi to high fi. And so examples include uh, very low fidelity paper sketches where you just draw diagrams on, uh, on a piece of paper. Um, now these can still be used for user interface experiments. So you can uh, talk to people about the process by which they go from one uh, diagram showing a, a particular window and, you know, hey, where would you, where would you uh, click on this window? Uh, you know, which buttons do you think you should use? Um, to wireframes, which are done on the computer, but where we're not concerned with uh, details that we would be on a real application, such as colors and fonts, uh, but the, the, the wireframe still gives us a good idea of what sort of information might be on that screen. Um, we can have a mock-up, uh, a higher quality mock-up with the fonts and the colors and other things actually worked in. And then we can have higher fidelity prototypes where um, the user can actually interact with them and press certain buttons. And so uh, the way this might work is, uh, suppose if we are working on an online bookstore, um, an example we'll use in more detail in a minute. Uh, and we could tell somebody, hey, go ahead and interact with our high fidelity mock-up here and look up a book on, um, say, South American history. And so the user would hopefully find the correct text field to enter in their search phrase and type South American history, and they would hit return. And we would move to another screen that showed the results of looking for South American history. But the key thing that's going on here is it doesn't really matter what you type in that text field. When you click on the search button, it only goes to results of South American history because that's the only thing we have it hardwired for. So here you've got a uh, prototype that, that looks real and has some interaction, but isn't the same as a real program. It's much, much more simplified. So these higher fidelity prototypes can give better results, but uh, they are somewhat problematic because it turns out that the more time and effort a team puts into creating uh, these prototypes, the harder it is for them to take results that suggest that that high fidelity prototype that they spent all that time on is in fact the wrong approach. Uh, it's much harder to toss it out. If the only thing you've done is drawn some diagrams um, on a piece of paper and you start interacting with users and finding out that, hey, your ideas are wrong, it's relatively low cost to toss out those paper diagrams and come up with another set of paper diagrams. I don't want to discount the cost of making paper diagrams, having uh, spent uh, so much time um, making some of the diagrams for, for these lectures. They are actually fairly time consuming, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's much less time consuming to come up with those diagrams, whether they're done on paper or on the computer, than it is to actually have interactive prototypes. I mentioned we were going to talk a little bit about a bookstore. So I want to do a little case study to sort of walk you through some of the things that we should be thinking about if uh, we're, we're designing a new program. So in this particular case, I uh, suppose the TAs and I got together and we decided that we wanted to do a new startup and we thought the best idea for a new startup was to create an online bookstore. That seems like a great idea, and I, I don't think anybody's done that, right? So, uh, so let's let's see how we could walk through the process of creating this online bookstore. Okay, so we need to be thinking about um, who our users are, uh, and remember what I said earlier. We wanted to be thinking about the roles and the tasks. And for this particular video, I'm just going to focus on our interaction with customers. But uh, if we were going to do this for real there would be a whole nother set of tasks involved with the employees of the bookstore. Um, but we're just going to focus on the customers. So we want to be thinking about who our website visitors are, um, why they're visiting the website, what their level of technical expertise is, what sort of devices do they have, and what their internet connections look like. How fast are they? How reliable are they? Things like that. And then we want to think about different tasks that, uh, they might want to interact with our website for. So the obvious one is I'm looking for a particular book, but that's not the only reason why somebody might come to the website. Um, they might be interested in a particular topic, but not be interested in a specific book or not have an idea of a specific book associated with that topic. And this is really a key distinction. Um, I think the Stanford Library has gotten better at this, but for a long time, 
they had a great interface when you were looking for a specific book. It would tell you, uh, hey, here's the book. Um, here's which library it's located in. Here's how many copies we have. Uh, here's how long that copy uh, is checked out for. And here's when it's going to be available next. Um, and so that was super useful. But when it came to, I've got a topic I'm interested in, but I don't know a specific book in that topic. It was a horrible, horrible interface. And so you need to think carefully about, you know, what are all the reasons why somebody might visit our uh, little bookstore here? And you want to think carefully about how to meet each of those needs. And then here's a third need down here at the bottom. Uh, you know, they might be sitting in class um, and they might be bored. And, you know, if they want to come visit our website, every time they go to uh, their exploring computing class, we would be happy for them to do that. We want to find new and interesting content to show them each day, um, have some idea of the sorts of things they're interested in and, you know, find nice glossy ways of presenting those books to them so that they come by frequently and hopefully get excited about something we show them and ultimately buy them. So these are three very different uh, reasons why somebody might visit our website and the sorts of things we might need to do on our website to meet each of these three different tasks are actually quite different. So you need to think carefully, why are people here? Not just, you know, what is the minimum sort of thing that somebody might need in order to come to our website, but try and be as expansive as possible. That's going to give you a broader uh, range of audiences and that's going to give you an overall better website. And then what we might want to do is come up with information on potential customers and keeping in mind that there are lots of different people visiting our website and they're all going to have different characteristics. And so one strategy that is often used, is to actually come up with user personas. So here are some potential customers. Uh, Nikki is a young professional. She visits the website on her cell phone. She has moderate uh, internet speeds on her cell phone. Um, but she often visits on her way home from work and the internet connection on her bus ride home is often kind of spotty. Patrick is a senior citizen. He has low technical expertise and visits the website on a Windows 95 laptop. Um, so, you know, do we want to support him? His web browser is likely to be pretty old and he might have some security issues because Windows 95 is no longer supported by Microsoft. Uh, and that's actually a good point. So, you know, you do need to think about, you know, what range of people are you going to support? Because the more people you support, um, you know, as, as we've talked a little bit with the HTML and the CSS, the more likely you are to run into problems with their web browser, the less compatible their web browser is, and the, the fewer the cool CSS stuff that you're going to be able to do is. Um, going back to uh, Patrick, our senior citizen here, though, uh, and so he has a really old laptop, but he does have a good internet connection. And then Maddie is a junior high school student. She's got moderate technical skills. Um, she's got a low end tablet, uh, but she does have good internet connection. And so uh, the idea here is we can think about the different tasks that, uh, we identified customers potentially doing on the website. And then in our meetings, when we're discussing the design, we can actually bring up these personas. So we can say, okay, this seems like a interesting design. And I could see how Nikki would be able to figure out how to use it. But what about Patrick? Would Patrick be able to figure this out? Or, you know, if we were thinking about the sorts of information displayed on our website, you might ask, would Nikki be able to see this part of the website well on her commute home? And if we're taking up too much bandwidth for her to do that, how are we going to provide her with an alternative? So creating these different personas and giving them names gives us a way to talk about these uh, sorts of users when we're in our, in our meetings. And then we will want to do user testing. And so as if we've talked about before, you're going to have different prototypes of different quality. Um, you're probably going to want to start off with the lo-fi prototypes because uh, the hi-fi prototypes take a lot of time and effort to get in. So, you know, spend some time with the lo-fi prototypes. And if it looks like you're in the right direction, you can go ahead and refine them and come up with more and more higher quality prototypes. Um, you need to get a bunch of users uh, who are not directly involved with the project. And in fact, you might want to try and get users that match your personas. So, you know, if we think we're going to have uh, senior citizens visiting our website uh, who are using Windows 95 uh, laptops, 
try and get some uh, older users who maybe don't have a lot of technical expertise, um, bring them in, uh, sit them down in front of your prototype, whatever level of prototyping you're doing, and ask them how to carry out particular tasks. Say, okay, suppose you're presented with a screen here. Um, try to find the new bestseller by Jane Cardinal. How do you think you would do that with this screen? And so, you know, whether they're presented with a paper prototype and hopefully uh, if it's a good drawing, they can sort of look it over and say, oh, I, I see how this would translate to a real computer program. I think, uh, you know, they could tap on the, the piece of paper and say, oh, I think I would, uh, I would enter something into this text field. Or if it's a high fidelity prototype, they can actually interact with it. They see the text field there, they can click their mouse on it and they can go ahead and enter that information there. Or we could ask them, suppose you're looking for a book on South American history, what would you do? And uh, they could take a look at your prototypes and figure out uh, exactly how they would interact with it. So ACI, as I said, is a really important field in computer science, and it's a great place for uh, people that may not have uh, a strong computer science background to get involved with helping to develop computer uh, products and programs.